Well, I'm uh, going to discuss motion of an object on a frictionless slope track that has a loop in it. And we have an object at rest uh, towards the top of this slope track. It's a distance h above the uh, ground level where the object will exit the, uh, the loop. The loop has a radius r. We want to know the expression for h in terms of r for this kind of borderline situation for as the object goes around the loop at the top for an instant there's zero contact force. So that's just the borderline case. If it's going faster then there would be contact force at the top. If it's going slower it leaves the track. So we want to be uh, on the track just barely, just barely making contact. So a picture might help uh, you think of the problem here. So we have ground level where h is equal to zero. Object on the slope track, no friction, so it doesn't matter the angle of the slope here. But uh, we come down, we enter the loop, we go around the loop, and then we exit out here to point C. And at the very top, there's no contact force between the uh, track and the object. There is still weight for the object, and that weight is necessary to provide the centripetal force. So that's going to be our, our clue to create an equation. Um, at the top, mg is a centripetal force, so mg is mv squared over r, the formula for centripetal force. v, the speed going around the circle, we square that. r is the radius of the circle. You can see the mass of the object cancels off. So we're left, and if we solve for the um, the speed squared, uh, that's just equal to g times r. And we're going to conserve energy now. We, we've got this much of a start, but let's conserve energy between location A and location B. There's a potential energy that's higher at point A. We're further away from the ground, and uh, some of that potential energy is now in the object as kinetic energy at point B. So if we write out what happens here for conservation of energy, mgh is our initial supply of energy at the start of the problem when we're at point A. When we're at point B, there's uh, some kinetic energy, and the height above the ground is 2 times r, the diameter of the loop. So mg and 2r, instead of writing another h here, an h2 or something, we can right away go ahead and put in 2r as the... Uh, vertical distance above ground level. Um, do a little bit of algebra here. Um, the v squared has been replaced with g times r. We're trying to solve for h, if you remember. So h is uh, going to be found because we can do some divisions. Every term has the mass in it. So we'll divide every term by m and every term has the acceleration due to gravity. So that disappears for us. So h, this first term gives us r over 2. The last term gives us 2r. Let's use a common denominator of 2. So to make this uh, uh, common denominator of 2, we need to increase the coefficient to 4. You can see we could recover the 2 here if I do the division. So r over 2 plus 4 over 2, we get 5r over 2. That's the height of the track we need. Just a real tangent question. If we take this loop to Mars, will it still have the same height that we release from, h of 5r over 2? The answer is yes. The acceleration due to gravity uh, does not appear in our calculation for h. So we could build one loop if we want, take it to uh, Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, and they will all behave in the same way, ignoring atmospheric effects. Uh, so 5 halves r, that's our value for h. Now, what's the speed of the object as it comes out of the loop? At point C, how fast is this object moving? Again, we don't have to worry about friction in this uh, calculation. Everything's frictionless. So we can go just directly from point A to point C. I don't have to use the uh, velocity at point B. Sorry about uh, blocking your view there. I don't have to use the velocity at point B. No friction along here. We'll take our supply of energy at A and use that to give us kinetic energy at point C. So mgh is 
1 half mv squared. The mass again appears in every term. We'll divide through by the mass. We'll multiply by 2. So v squared is 2gh. If I take a square root, um, square root of 2gh is equal to v. Now let's put some particular numbers to this. Nothing real big, but suppose we have a loop that has a radius of 0.3 meters. Well, the h value where we want to start our object is 0.75 meters. Is that consistent with my drawing? If r is 0.3 meters and h is 0.75, Yes, 2r would be 0.6 meters, and h of 0.75 were above point b, so that's okay with our drawing. Um, let's continue. So we can use the formulas that were uh, developed in, as part of the solution. At the top of the loop, um, v squared is gr. If we want to find the speed at the top of the loop, we would have 9.81 times uh, 0.3. That was our formula we developed up above for v squared. v squared is just g times r. It's not 2r. This is correct. v squared is g times r. So we would end up, you know, v squared is 2.943. The velocity is 1.72 meters per second. I do that so I can compare to the velocity at the exit. At the exit, just using conservation of energy, uh, square root of 2gh to 9.81 times 0.75, multiply that together, then take a square root, we get 3.84. Is it correct that the speed of the object at point C, 3.84 meters per second, is larger than the speed of the object at point B, 1.72 meters per second? The answer is yes. At point B, some of the energy is tied up uh, in potential energy, not available for the kinetic energy. When we're at point C, all of the potential energy at point A has uh, converted over to the kinetic form of energy. So you might want to go back and uh, pause the video at certain places, do the calculations yourself, that that's the motion of a uh, object on a frictionless track that has a loop.